didn't record it, right? Okay. Okay, great. I'll hit continue here. Oh, that took me back. Is my screen still sh sharing? Okay. I changed the format now, but that's okay. Can everyone still see the slides clearly? I tried to make them pretty basic so they were easy to read. Okay. So career intervention strategies, as we have talked about since week one in this course, they're not occurring in a vacuum. And it's important to be aware of the influences that are impacting our students and therefore impacting the way in which we approach these discussions about what it is that careers are and how to get there. So I just wanted to make sure I emphasize that. Where is my mouse? There we go. Okay, so Jesse B. Davis was the first person within the text um, that I wanted to make sure that we highlighted here. I'm gonna move my boxes. Okay. Um, so about a hundred, well, over a hundred years ago now, that's when the first um, philosophy around systematic career education efforts were first implemented into schools. And so Jesse B. Davis, he was working in 1898 as a counselor to address educational and career problems among 11th grade students um, in the state of Michigan at Central High School in Detroit. So while he was doing this work with 11th grade students, um, he realized that there needed to be something more organized, a program for vocational and moral guidance. Um, and he began implementing that once he was in a principal role in the early 1900s, 1907. And so he was the first to start realizing that there was maybe more of a need than just focusing on vocational aspects. He started to broaden that perspective of looking at students more than just, are you ready to enter the workforce, um, you know, physically and, and skillfully. Um, that, that moral guidance piece became part of his approach. And so he began counseling with respect to courses, extracurricular activities that students found enjoyment in, and the incorporation of vocated, vocational related assignments. Um, and that was happening within the core curriculum of school. So not just the vacuum type of approach, more of it being an integrated cultural experience within the school setting. Frank Parsons is another person that we'll hear about quite a bit tonight. And I can, can tell you that his name will come up time and time again when talking about career counseling within the school setting. He is infamously known as the father of vocational guidance. He founded the Breadwinners College. It's, it's also often referred to as the Breadwinners Institute. And he was providing educational opportunities for immigrants as well as young people who were in need of employment. Um, he also um, engaged in this type of work with the Vocational Bureau in 1908. So 1908, I think that's significant to keep in mind as we talk about the next few things. Um, he introduced the first systematic framework for addressing vocational needs in a counseling setting. And this framework is known as the Parsonian framework and it's simplistic and it's still applicable to today's world. So in 1908, we are still referencing essentially the Parsonian framework and the work that we do in schools um, surrounding career counseling. So a three-step career decision-making process. Those three steps are on this slide and they are as follows. So Parsonian framework, number one, develop a clear understanding of yourself, your aptitudes, your abilities, interests, resources, limitations, and other qualities that make you you. Who are you as a person, a whole person? Um, after that area is addressed and understood, you then develop knowledge of the requirements and conditions of success, the advantages, the disadvantages, the compensation and available opportunities 
in different lines of work. So who I am as an individual, the various options that are before me, um, weighing out the pros and cons within all of those options and just being mindful again of what is available within within my within my environment within my um, desired location of, of where I will be, will be engaging in work and then what I really like about number three is this true reasoning idea so using true reasoning on the relations of these two groups of facts and I think so much of what he said in 1908, um, applies to some of the concepts we've talked about as a group and certainly what it is that I do in approaching students in either a classroom or a small group setting or in my indiv individual work with students and helping them fully uh, and comprehensively identify the factors that really do help to do that process that uh, Grafton discusses, the, the transcending the dichotomy um, between work and leisure pleasure activities. Um, this framework still very much um, is helpful with those types of discussions. Uh, so Frank Parsons, in addition to his Parsonian framework, um, he really helped kick off the establishment of counselor certification programs. So within a few years of his work, uh, the school system of Boston created the first counselor certification program. Um, and eventually, um, pretty soon after, that was adopted by Harvard. And um, at Harvard University, it became the first counselor education program in 1911. Uh, shortly after that, school districts across the country were, were quickly following suit um, and training and appointing of vocational counselors within the school setting um, was really happening on a more consistent and regular as well as growing basis. Um, and that was in order to meet the demands of the vocational interventions in school that have now been established at this time. So John M. Brewer is another name that I think is very much important to know and to remember. Um, in 1918, he wrote and published a book titled Vocational Guidance Movement and explored both its, po its, its problems as well as the possibilities associated to that movement. Um, he had seven questions that he used to conceptualize um, the concerns surrounding vocational guidance. And he is another one where I feel like the date is so significant for me. So in 1918, the seven questions that he created are still very much seven questions that either still do not have answers <laughs> or that we're still asking and the answers are evolving um, as we're exploring these seven questions. So the seven questions include, what can be done to give children vocational outsight, insight and purpose? So what can we do in schools to widen each child's vocational horizon? What are we able to do as trained professionals to broaden what it is that they know? And oftentimes, Still today, even with the constant access to internet um, capabilities. Students know what they know based on what they've been exposed to through family um, influence, uh, through what they, what they experience in their life. And at school, what can we do to make sure that each student's horizon is broadened, regardless of their access or their experiences um, from family um, influences? The next is how can the individual discover his talents? So what needs to be done? What can be brought forth to students as far as opportunities and discovering their self, knowing what it is um, that makes them who they are, their strengths, their weaknesses, their aptitudes, their abilities. How can we get students to get to that point in that exploration? Other questions, how may a person prepare for his occupation? How shall we obtain and use occupational information? What are some methods appropriate in guidance? These are all questions that are still constantly being asked among school counseling teams, administrators. These are essentially what are best practices for the field that we're finding ourselves in? How do we make sure what it is that students need or is what they're receiving um, from our role within their uh, school experience? Um, and then 
what how, how may a principal or superintendent inaugurate a plan for vocational guidance? And I put in there, um, again, the page numbers as well as the year that Brewer composed these seven questions. That, that last piece, I actually was at my office yesterday and that was a question that we were sitting around a table discussing, you know, plans for implementation. So for the last hundred years, this has been a constant question um, that I think really helps to hold stakeholders accountable and making sure that what it is that students need is what students are receiving. So those people were all involved um, at a period of time in the book, it references the early professional era. So uh, cornerstone um, contributors that really helped to lay the foundation, the groundwork for everything that would then transpire after um, that time period to bring career counseling and the role of career counselors in schools um, to where we are today. So from beyond the early professional era, and these are just summary points, um, key factor is that there was a shift in focus. So no longer was there just a job placement perspective. Um, the practitioners were really be understanding the value of incorporating personal counseling in addition to academic advisement. So more of that whole child, whole person um, focus was a result of the early professional era. The professional establishment era was directly following the first. Um, that, is, that is documented to have happened from 1949 to 1989. And this evolution is still occurring during this time period. Um, a lot of this section is, is um, the discussions that we've had in prior weeks that I think Grafton did an excellent job in covering very thoroughly. Um, so, so much of the, the happenings in this time period were directly tied to the economic, social, and political history of our country and beyond. Um, a watershed moment, that was the terminology used in the, tech, in the textbook, um, that happened with the passing of the National Defense Education Act, which was in 1958. That was directly following the launch of Sputnik by the Soviet Union. It was watershed because federal funding became available in the masses to increase the funding needed to have more school counselors at hand for students um, to have access to. Uh, the primary focus, focus was to make sure that students were being maximized to their potential. Um, so that success was happening for both workers, um, for their role as workers and as citizens. So there was a major shift um, in funding available. And so the, the profession really began to take off at that time due to societal uh, forces. Yeah, so the, so the secret part of that is that, uh, you know, because we were in a space race after Sputnik, so they, they kind of told school counselors to steer students into the sciences. But then if you look, hey, 10 years later, we're, we're on the moon, you know? Right, right. No, I think that's pretty pivotal. Um, and I think at the time it was where the need was. Um, well, depending on the value that maybe you held with that movement. Um, but ultimately, um, it was very much a step in the right direction in terms of fostering student growth and development because um, the need was there and our profession was trained and designed to meet that need. So it was very impact, it was an impactful time all around. The transition era, which is the era we're now in. So 1989 to the present time. And I never want anyone to think that my inability to correctly pronounce this gentleman's name means that he's not significant. But Grafton, can you please help me? Do you say Geisbers, Gisbers? I never know for sure. Geisbers. <laughs> he is still alive. I searched for him today. I wanted to try to make sure that I could come on here well-informed and educated on how to say the man's name. He's 88 years old. 
I watched a YouTube presentation on him this, this morning. He is still very connected to the profession and he is a primary contributor to the current direction in school counseling and um, consistent. And he wrote, he wrote the book they're going to use in foundations. Did he? Foundations of school counseling. He wrote a book on the ASCA model. So yes, yeah. yes. I wish that we could be friends. I mean, just listening to him for a few minutes this morning, I thought it was a 57 minute long um, presentation he was doing somewhere in Los Angeles. And there was a part of me that just thought, this is just what they need to hear. But no, you need to hear from me instead. So Gisbers, Geisbers. Let me, can you say it one more time? I'm gonna do my- Geisbers. My Geis. Geis. Like Geis with a G. Okay. Okay. And as Grafton said, he is a um, foundational member of the design, the development of the American School Counselor Association, its national model. Um, and he was a very big. Um, contributor to the National Center for Transforming School Counselors. So very important agencies, organizations, I mean, um, and they still today are the leading um, association and bodies for which school counseling practices are built upon and designed to, to, to uh, bring the appropriate um, delivery of service to each student at every developmental level. So in this time period that we're still experiencing now, I highlighted the, the term emerging roles for school counselors. So as each time period is experienced, emerging roles are, are surfacing. And so these terms are terms that you'll now see in the ASCA model. Um, there are terms that will be involved in job descriptions of school counselors. Um, the society and the needs of students have called us to serve as leaders in school reform, um, as advocates for student needs. Um, we are very much involved and looked upon as experts in closing the achievement gaps experienced by the marginalized um, populations, as well as those from um, disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, the, the closing of achievement, achievement gaps is still essential to the school counselor's role. And everything falls under the umbrella of data-driven practices. So that is the biggest difference, I would say, in my experience from learning of the previous eras to finding myself in the transition era now. Data is everything in improving the school counseling programs and the outcomes that students are able to uh, meet and achieve. There's a section in this chapter that really spent some time on this on this phrase life career development and the importance of pausing and taking some time to really think through each of these three components. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I put that in a slide and then just took the time to kind of talk through that with you and um, to see if you had any thoughts or any reactions to really looking at these as three individual um, phenomena that are that are occurring within one phrase. So life, career, development. And when you think of the term life in this phrase, it really depicts the total person and all aspects of one's lived experiences and how those are constantly changing over the course of a lifetime, which that in and of itself is a pretty big thing to conceptualize. Then you add in the term career, which in this sense, career incorporates the many settings in a person's life. So one has a role that they play at school. One has a role or roles that they play within their home. And the same goes for their um, engagement in their community and the roles that they play in each of those area areas all impact and are integrated with one another. So there are many roles that we play. It's not just your one job that you might have at a specific time. The many roles are um, intertwining and influential of our life experiences. 
and then development is my go-to word. <laughs> Not only as a school counselor, but just, um, you know, in terms of overall looking at the focus and what's most important within a school setting. And it's that concept of development. And in this sense, it's indicating that people continue to grow and change over the course of their lifetime. So when you think of all of those terms in conjunction as one thought or one, one approach, um, it really helps to instill career consciousness at all grade levels and all age levels, that these are all things that are always happening and changing really since birth. Um, and so life career development might be a phrase where you think, okay, I know what that means. But when you take time to really dissect and think of the many intricate layers and processes and experiences that are involved when those three component, components are combined, it is, um, it is a really big deal. So Geispers, now that I have my cheat sheet here, uh, he really emphasizes to this day, uh, the study of and the addressing of the whole person um, and making sure as we've talked in previous weeks uh, that viewing one's events, roles and settings in which their life is happening, all of those aspects need to be considered when exploring career opportunities and um, aspirations. So many career programs, even the ones that exist today, can just focus on the demands of the labor market instead of globally considering the overall human development that each and every one of us are experiencing. Um, even early on in my career, I very much felt myself falling into that focus where students would log on to the, the program that we were using at the time. And the first thing they wanted to do was just see, you know, how much money, how much money can I make? What's the job that I can choose where I'll make the most money? And I could see the excitement. So I'd kind of grow with it and get with them on that topic. But there was no consideration and developmentally it made sense, but there was no consideration of what it was that that job entailed how it aligned to the values that they had, were they even aware of their values? It was just about the money. And I think so many times that comes from those influences that they know, you know, you have to find a job to be successful. And I just feel really called to make sure that students are exploring other aspects. And I, I really talk to them about, you can have all the money in the world and absolutely hate what you do every day. And that money all of a sudden doesn't seem to matter. And as much as I try to be relatable, they still sometimes think like, yeah, right. All I need is money. Um, but I think as we, <laughs> as we have this conversations, I think it changes. Is someone talking? I hope so. Um, yes, I just had a question. So yes. you, you mentioned that with your students and you try to get them to see this more like holistic idea yes. uh, behind career development. How would you, um, I guess, approach if they're really influenced by their parents' desires for them to have a successful, as far as, I guess, successful as far as like wages and, right. you know, that influence on them? Right, right. So I loved how Grafton talked last week about how I am not, I'm not ever going to, I hope that no one ever sees me um, or experiences me as like a dream destroyer. Um, so I very much want to try, um, and a lot of these conversations are in a group setting. Um, so if individual sessions can happen after the fact, we can get into some more uh, specific discussions, but I try to open that so everyone kind of has an experience around that talk. And we talk about, you know, well, what is successful? What does that, what does that mean to you? How would you define that? And then we, I try to be more global about, you know, okay, well, what is happiness? And how does that, how is that something that you experience? How often do you experience that? What are things that are happening when you experience that? Are those things that can happen when you go to work? Or is it only in these certain times? And trying to have them, I like the word that you used. Who was that talking to me? I only see four faces. Uh, it's Rosa. Thank I you. knew it was. Okay. Um, trying to just have them start to see that it's more than money. And even with that, because I, I don't ever want to, um, I really strive to have um, trusting, collaborative relationships with my parents and families of students that I have. 
um, not discourage what it is that they say they value, um, but just looking at, okay, is this the only career in which you feel that your son, daughter, your child can have, um, you know, a, a high paying successful career? Um, the, the answer is no, but I don't know. Sometimes it's not no for them. Uh, I do have students, my, my district is very, um, there's a broad ranging experience of families. We have very, very low socioeconomic status families to multi-million dollar home, homes and developments in, in the area that I serve. And so some of those uh, more uh, affluent families really do, not always, but do have this, this pressure um, that as students are coming to me in sixth grade, they feel they're, they know they're going to be this, this neurosurgeon because that's my dad, that's my uncle, that's my dad's cousin. They'll come to me with this plan without any, any time. They've, ever, they've never let themselves have that own uh, dialogue on whether or not that's what they want. And so I try to make it safe for them to have those opportunities for themselves, at least in our classroom lessons or in our individual sessions, to at least have other options of consideration for them and not to feel as if the pressure is on when they're 12 to follow into that plan that the parents set for them without ever considering their own child's interests or desires. And it's, it's sad, but it's also empowering because they do still have time. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, and because uh, kids that age, they think money buys happiness. They do. But the so there's uh, a couple journal articles out that explored that. Does money buy happiness? And what they found was that um, so the, enough money alleviates anxiety. So, I know, so for instance, I know my parents experienced a lot of anxiety because sometimes they didn't have enough to pay their necessary bills like heat or water or electric or things like that. And that created anxiety and worry. But if you have enough money that uh, you can, you know, have some type of home that you appreciate, that you have enough food, and that you're able to buy all those basic necessities and have a little bit left over, what that does is it removes the anxiety that was taking up a lot of your emotions. And when you remove anxiety, that makes room for happiness. And, uh, but it's other things that give you the happiness, yeah. That is interesting and helpful to more fully understand where it is they're coming from. And I think that would be helpful information for them to have too, as they're forming their own plan and their own goals for themselves. I messed up, didn't I? I finally got the screen big again and it took me back, that's okay. These are just more key points of what a school counselor's role is within career development. So it's not their role in isolation. Um, research shows that they are called to be an advocate and really establishing and, man and maintaining um, an effective career development program, but they're not the isolated um, adult role in which students receive their career education. Um, there should be a ton of avenues, multiple avenues in which career development services are delivered. So I do a lot of in-classroom lessons. I do um, help at times when planning, um, collaborative planning can be available. I do help uh, teams of teachers create career-oriented lessons, really tying core content in to um, help begin to answer those questions. Well, why are we learning this? When will I ever use this? 
and helping to have that, again, become part of the educational culture so that it's not just, oh, the counselor talks about jobs and then everything else that we're doing and using and, and learning in school, that's just for school. Just really start to bridge that gap in that sense as well. And so making it meaningful for what they are doing in their role as a student, which is their current career, um, and making that make sense um, as much as possible. And then experiential activities and service learning opportunities those have really shown to increase student interest and engagement in exploring the world of work and opportunities that can be available to them. So the big thing is this last bullet here, what we're trying to make sure we no longer do. I think there was a period of time um, in our role as school counselors where this became the, no the norm. And as long as you met with a group of students one time a year and gave an overall lesson on what it was to have a career um, that that was enough. You could check the box and you can move on. Um, and we're really seeing that that is not impactful, um, which is pretty obvious, um, but that it needs to become embedded into the curriculum and consistent throughout each and every year that they're finding themselves in school. So I wanted to bring up a few of our friends that we're continuously learning about um, through your own um, assessments, as well as processing what it is that your partner um, has, has received as a result of their assessments. So um, I think as I talk through this, just think about how it, how it would be that you would use John Holland, his typology approach um, in addressing uh, career standards within the school setting. Uh, so very much um, a focus on personalities and aspects of their, their lived experiences, their backgrounds, and um, focusing on what attracts them to a particular career. So Holland would be very useful in just opening up those discussions and having that dialogue with students on, you know, who they are and what they like about the jobs that we are, we're having them explore and having them learn about. And then having them take a look at those similarities between their own analysis of themselves and the careers that they are preferring. Um, in the book, it talks about the modal personal style. Um, and that is when a person selects a career to satisfy that preferred personal um, modal, that personal preferred mot motivation um, for, for their career path. And so again, his theory emphasize, emphasizes the accuracy. So knowing oneself truly and then making the career information necessary for uh, career decision making. So knowing of true self and making sure that's an alignment to what it is that they are seeking to find for themselves as their career. And then our other friend, Mr. Donald Super, his developmental approach is very much a good fit for career counseling within the schools. Um, his approach is multi-sided, um, involves self-concept theory, involves developmental stages, vocational maturity that we discussed last week, and then career dimensions for adolescents. So self-concept is very much again at play here. How a, how, a, how a student pictures themselves, and I like this, the constellation of self-attributes considered by the individual to be vocationally relevant. So who they are and how that matches to what they wanna be in a career. Um, two of the five developmental periods are where students are finding themselves in as they're sitting in a classroom or in front of me in a career counseling session. Um, so the five developmental periods from super are growth, exploratory, establishment, maintenance, and decline. And growth and exploratory um, periods are happening whenever students are within uh, typical school age. Same with the five developmental tasks that he refers to. Crystallization is where I find my, my students at the end of their middle school experience. And then they go on to be in the developmental tasks of specification um, when they're in their high school years. And their plan that they begin as early as kindergarten in my school district, this follows with them through their developmental periods. And I'll go into a little more detail with that if you'd like to see what that looks like from, from my point of view and my position. 
So the ASCA national standards for school counseling programs uh, initially published in 1997. And these three national standards are still uh, the three areas of focus today within the school counseling profession. So while career is very much a focus for um, meeting developmental needs and milestones for students, our time is also spent on addressing the academic development as well as the personal social development of each and every student. So within all of the standards, and I know the majority of you are not on the school counseling track, so I just wanted to give a brief overview. I think this makes sense and applies to all the work that you will do as a professional counselor, but I know in, in classes to come, if you've not already had, you'll have courses that are specifically designed to talk about ASCA, the national standards, and then the national model. So I won't, I won't go into too much detail, but I do think it's important for this section. So from the standards come the competencies, from the competencies come the behavioral indicators, which are all measurable um, and data-driven. And the national standards were an important step um, in getting us to where we are today with the ASCA national model. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. So this ASCA national model, it's kind of crazy for me to think that this has really only been around for about 20 years, a little over 20 years. Um, certainly the biggest milestone um, as of the last 20 years um, for the profession of school counseling. It becomes the day-to-day -day framework um, for developing and implementing school counseling programs, addressing all three of those uh, main areas, the domains of academic career and personal social needs. Again, of all students, and that's a big piece. Um, not the needs of just a few, but the developmental needs of all and making sure that the program addresses all aspects for all students. So Geispers and Henderson were the founders um, of who created this Ask a National Model in the year of 2000. Um, and they were strongly influenced by the Education Trust and National Center for Transforming School Counseling. Um, again, this is offering an organized system for, these are keywords that I should have also highlighted, but they're there, assessing, designing, implementing, and evaluating comprehensive school counseling programs, comprehensive in the sense of all students, but also all grade levels. So career counseling begins as early as kindergarten because of this model. This was the clearest picture I could find. Is someone saying Allison, something? Allison, I have a question. Yes. Um, my undergrad's in education, but I'm in clinical counseling right now. Okay. And I taught preschool, I taught Head Start, and our curriculum was designed, I get it for STEAM, Okay. Yes. Um, what I feel is an issue <laughs> is that they wanted us to teach kids about things like rebar. Like when you're building a house, what do you use rebar for? <laughs> okay. Right. And they're, they're three and four. Yeah. And yes. like, they keep saying this is like appropriate for career choices. These kids don't know not to pick their nose or wash their hands. <laughs> and like, like, you, like, how does this, does this, like, is this kind of like going with that too? Like, are they trying to get it that young? It is. And I love, I love that you just brought that up. I actually have the page marked here of Grafton. I'm not sure if you can readily access in your mind the case study of Frank here. Um, but what you're saying to me reminds me of Frank and I'll, I'll hopefully get to that before we close. But there is um, this idea of concept and this idea of conceptual best practice. This is, this is just me, Allison speaking, not Allison school counselor speaking. Um, and then there's the practicality of that best practice. And I think sometimes the decision makers and the practitioners, there is a very big gap and learning curve that is not always nicely um, experienced. And so while the intention was good to have you begin the STEAM, STEM, it's actually at this point now, I think it's getting a little bit ridiculous. I think it's stream with two M's at the end. So um, it's basically every possible avenue of um, a career that is now in this acronym. Um, but 
the the intention and the theory behind it is good, but the execution of that theory, I think, is a little um, it needs well, it needs to evolve. I think um, I think students are very moldable and impressionable beginning at you know the earliest it, at since birth. But that that particular example that you just gave, I think that there is a time and a place and probably a pre K program is not the time or the place for that particular idea. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that Grafton? <laughs> yeah, so we do have a whole chapter on steam, yes. which you're going to go over next next week. But uh, so there's two there's two different things. One is the ask a model. Uh, is more about teaching about careers, mm -hmm. where STEAM is the actual teaching of skills and concepts in subject matter. But yeah, so that's a good example you gave that, you know, it has to be age appropriate. So a more age appropriate thing would be, uh, okay, uh, preschoolers, we're going to make a build a bridge and we're going to have a competition with teams out of popsicle sticks. And we're going to see which bridge can hold the most weight without falling down. Right. You know, so that's fun. And they're still learning the concept of rebar, which is reinforcement of concrete, but they're just using popsicle sticks and having a fun game. So yeah, it has steam has to be age appropriate but it also has to be hands-on learning. And, uh, but that's a little different. We're gonna talk about that in the STEAM chapter. Um, so this is actually teaching kids about careers and career paths, whereas STEAM is teaching them about career skills. Yeah, hope that answers your question, but yeah, that's not appropriate. <laughs> Thank you so much. I always felt it wasn't appropriate and I just couldn't wrap my brain around this. Like, why are they doing this? <laughs> right, right. The why, the why behind is hard whenever, and, and that's another thing too, that we can, we can transition into that for next week, but Grafton just um, kind of deciphering between the two while they can go together and overlap, they are different. Um, but I do say, even when I have these conversations with parents, and this is this is off topic, but not really, because it's the same concept. They'll call and demand, you know, that my child be in pre-algebra six. Uh, they they are they are above and beyond. Um, they can't be in general math six. They need to be in pre-algebra six, which is essentially skipping two math levels. Um, and there's strict criteria because it's data driven. Um, that we know that these standards need to be met in order for students to find success. And so, you know, they'll, they'll have this argument, we'll have these conversations. Ultimately, you know, we want to make sure that people are challenged. If parents, the experts of their own children, not, the, not our program, but of their children want them to try, then we, we put them in there and have them try. But what I cannot stand as a, as a school counseling professional is when, when the stress is um, superseding and there is no enjoyment, no um, feeling of accomplishment. And then you see, you see sometimes that student just crumble and their self-confidence and their self-concept and what they think they can do, what they think they're worth sometimes can be greatly impacted because that mismatch is happening. And so, so with your example of the preschool and having that bar set so high, I think examples like Grafton gave where you're starting small and letting them have that feeling of success, that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling then of, you know, my, my ability, my confidence, my self-worth can then just, um, you know, grow as well. So setting the bar high, making sure things are challenging, uh, but not overwhelming. I think there's a fine line in all of those programs and all of those approaches to what it is that we're bringing to, to the table now with these students. Um, but yes, this is the national model from which our 339 plan, which will be in a slide or two, um, is founded upon. And so these four components in the middle are areas that we um, build our programming from. So we, we have a foundation, we have a, a, a delivery method, delivery system, um, all of our efforts and our practices need to be accountable um, and managed. And so the terms around, I actually think 
that the model has just recently been updated to kind of clean it up a little bit and make it more crisp and succinct. Those are all of the, um, the roles that we're called to do as school counseling professionals. So we're advocates, we're leaders, we're collaborators. Um, we are, um, I think what's the other one, systematic change. So we, we promote systematic change. So those action words, I don't think are in the most updated model, but the four components are still what drives our development of our program. Yeah, and so interestingly enough, uh, when I, um, so, you know, just, just put, a, put a date on me, uh, <laughs> when I um, got my doctorate, I graduated in 2000, and the first thing they asked me uh, in my interview uh, for, for a job was, uh, do you understand the ASCA model? So, you know, if you are going in to be a school counselor, uh, you know, they will ask you about the ask a model. So it is important. It is very important. And just being part of, now it's just my school district, but I have now in 12 years gone through three rounds of hiring new counselors within our district. And I have been fortunate to be a part of that committee at times. And it always is an area that is asked. And those that can speak fluently about the purpose and the elements and the ways in which it's practiced are ones that go to the next round. Those that stumble and have no idea. And sometimes I don't know where some of these students came from as far as their training, but they don't know what it is. And so it's definitely something to be mindful of. And I would say too, um, if you're finding yourself in a private practice or at an agency of some sort, and you do collaborate with schools, um, knowing the model from which students are coming from within their school programming is going to help, help you um, in, in doing treatment planning and assessing the clients that see you in the community. Um, there was one part I'll bring up too at some point, but um, not right now as far as um, a new way in which I looked at career counseling. And I'll make sure I say it before the end. It's my little story that really changed and shifted my mind on the significance um, of that conversation with each and every student. Um, but just quickly, I'll go over the elements of the ASCA model. So as I said, the foundation, that addresses the what. So what every student will know and be able to do um, the delivery system is the how of the model. So the counseling program will be put into place and that will consist of the curriculum that happens within the classroom setting, individual student planning during career uh, counseling sessions, responsive services at any time if there's any kinds of, of intervention needed, and then system support really addresses the continuation of professional de development and networking. Um, so that's the how of the system. The management of the system addresses the when and the why of the program. Um, that will um, really be um, where the advisory council meetings, um, and I'll talk about that before we close, uh, where data is reviewed, where action plans for individual students or grade levels are developed, where time and event calendars are formulated. And my counseling team really woke up to the importance of the calendar um, process. And I'll share that with you as well. Um, at first we thought it was like a very like simple and like nonsense activity. And when you do collectively put together the events that happen month to month based on your developmental level of, uh, of your work, um, it shows how quickly you don't have time if you don't plan for these activities. And to be very honest, if you're one counselor, so for me, I'm almost double the um, recommended ratio of ASCA. It's supposed to be one school counselor for every 250 students. I'm almost at 500 students at my middle school level for grades six through eight. And so if you are not pre-planning when these career interventions are happening, they very much can easily not happen because of the crisis um, intervention practices that you're involved in instead of the preventative pre-planned activities that are meaningful for all students. And so it is a very helpful process to 
to do. And it's not, it, not only because it's mandated, but because it improves the overall implementation of the comprehensive plan. And then finally, accountability is the how. So how are students different as a result of this comprehensive program? And again, please let me know if you have any comments or questions. How, how does your school handle like all the data and measure measuring this, this kind of stuff? So we try to be very realistic with all of our data-driven plans. And so we do start small. So every SMART goal that we have um, in this plan that I will share with you, the elementary level counselors had one data-driven goal in which they measured for that year. And it was very specific. It was very realistic. It was very easily attainable. Um, again, because just as what we don't wanna do with our students, we, want, we don't wanna do with ourselves as a department. We don't wanna be overwhelmed and we don't wanna collect for the sake of collecting. We only wanna collect what it is that we're going to use and improving what it is that we bring to the table as far as programs and activities. Um, my goal and the plan that I have at the middle school level um, was around um, the creation of, um, let me think of how I worded this, the creation of individualized student portfolios. Um, and I set a high goal of 95% of students would leave eighth grade um, with a career portfolio um, with at least, oh my gosh, I haven't looked at it in a while, but with at least I think eight artifacts um, that they will then carry over with them to the high school level. And then some, some activities at the high school level, um, the data goes around pre and post test knowledge um, after having a classroom lesson be implemented for them. Um, so we start small, um, but then as we get more comfortable and get better at analyzing what it is that we collect, we add to. So those goals that we do um, meet typically just get adjusted and then we add something new. So there are three standards that are surrounding the um, career domain of uh, the ASCA national model. And so, as I said earlier, under the standard is then a competency. So what the student will do and then how we'll know that they have met that. Um, and those are the three areas. So they will acquire skills to investigate the world of work in relation to knowledge of self and to make informed career decisions. They will employ strategies to achieve future career goals with success and satisfaction. Students will understand the relationship between personal qualities, education, training, and the world of work and how all of those, all of those components must be understood to make an informed decision for themselves. So here it is, the chapter 339 mandate, which has been in place for quite some time, um, but was recently, um, oh, I don't even know how to say this, I guess dusted off the shelves and really called back into action. Um, this is a mandated plan for all uh, school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the plan must be con comprehensive and integrated. Um, into the um, pre-K through 12 guidance plan. So the mandate states that there shall be a written plan on file approved by the school board and the development and implementation of a comprehensive sequential program of guidance services. So what has been um, initiated and implemented at the elementary school, there should be a seamless transition of activities that are developmentally driven that then happen at the middle school and then the transition from middle school to high school with their, with their individual career portfolio following them the whole way through, which is why recently um, in the last four years now, we've moved to an online um, program so that, that that portfolio is more um, easily transitioned instead of the paper packets that we had done in years past. Um, so that is where we're at right now. The ASCA informed concepts are continuously serving as the foundation of comprehensive school counseling planning. I do have my chapter three through nine plan 
Grafton, if you would like for me to go over that tonight, I can. I could also save it for another time. I don't, I want to be mindful of, of tonight and your plans as well. Uh, yeah, you can share, share it. Now's the time, I think. Okay. I'll stop this share. Alice, yes. how re recent is all of this stuff? Because I'm thinking back to my time in elementary school and, right. or, and I think, I don't think I realized I had a guidance counselor till I was like a sophomore in high school. Yes. Your, your situation sounds so much like mine. Um, I had one conversation with my high school guidance counselor, and that was because I needed for him to sign my application to W and J. And he had to, I can make fun because this is my profession. He had to put down his coffee mug, fold his newspaper, put it to the side, uncross his legs, get a pen out, look that it was for Washington and Jefferson College, and then did one of these and just said, it's a really hard school. Do you have a backup plan? <laughs> and that was my that was my individual planning session with my school counselor at 12th grade. So um, I feel you on that. I remember not ever wanting to go back except to let him know that I did get in. So that was one follow up conversation we did have. Um, so this is all from what was the was it 1997? I think was when the first the, the standards started. And then the model followed. And so, so much of what we experienced as students was evolving, but not mandated. And so this, the experience is, and really should be, um, but is mandated to be much different now for students today. That's a good question though. Yeah, I mean, and look at, look at your numbers of kids, you know, right. I mean, and that's with it being mandated. I mean, right. before they didn't even have that many school counselors in elementary and middle school. Um, but uh, this did force a lot of school districts to hire at least one additional school counselor right. uh, so that they can implement this mandate. Um, and for a while, there was some funding for that. Right. So. Uh, but but yeah, Alex, you're you're right. I mean, a lot of times school counselors are are dealing with emergencies, you know. And uh, fortunately, now even if you don't have uh, an issue to deal with, uh, at least hopefully you'll see the school counselor in the classroom a lot more. That's right. been a big change too. Uh, when I was in school, school counselors didn't teach any guidance lessons, and now they should be. Uh, yeah. So I'll make sure I go over this line by line for the next 51 pages. No, I will not do that to you. All right. So these are all the components, uh, the, the, um, the model, the draft. What am I trying to say? The components are all standard. Um, so there's pretty much a um, outline that we follow. This, as you will see, is from 2017. It is to be updated every three years. Um, we typically do that in the summer. Ours, it, it's best practice to have it updated every three years um, and actually might be mandated. I think we received grace since our update was due in 2020. We were not permitted to report to our summer duties in person. This type of collaboration is really hard to do online. And so now it's become our July focus. So in the next few weeks, um, updating this information will be where I spend my time um, during department meetings. Um, so the template, that's the word, I couldn't figure it out. The template is the same. It asks for the um, assignment of school counselors. That's just to showcase whether or not you do have elementary counselors, which we do, we do have two. Um, we also, as you can see, Sarah Lang is actually no longer with our district. She has moved on to another district, um, but that person has just been replaced. The position is still there. So we have one elementary counselor, K through five, and you can see she has 531 students, roughly give or take, that could change from year to year. So at least the numbers should be updated. Um, but we also have a South Buffalo elementary counselor. You can see the numbers are much smaller in that school district. And that person's also responsible for uh, K through 12 college and career readiness. So Sarah is now Emily. 
Emily does a lot of um, K through 12 planning for um, events. So middle school career days, guests or career days, guest speakers, um, uh, field trips, um, when we're allowed to do those again. Um, we have pathway models at the high school where we make sure um, we visit a business or an organization that fits within each pathway. I can talk about that a little bit more next year, but she does more of the comprehensive activity planning. Whereas then I am at the middle school at that year, I had 460. And then we have two high school counselors, um, which they are, they are good to go. They follow, they follow the ASCA standard, which is great. The mission statement of the district um, in terms of career planning is then listed next in the plan. And then the goals. So these were the SMART goals that I was referring to. And I'll just show you quickly here. So there is a set template for each grade level or building level um, so that the goals are clearly understood, they're measurable. So when you think to yourself as a student, when am I ever gonna use a SMART goal? You're gonna use it if you're writing a 339 plan in addition to your treatment plans. Um, these are hard to write initially because you want it to be specific enough, um, but not too specific. And so this is really a good team effort approach to make sure that we're all helping each other identify SMART goals that are good goals, um, but that are also attainable. A quick question. Sure. Um, so in your experience, not just with your school district at Freeport, but just generally in the field itself, how mm -hmm. much, I guess, autonomy do you have or does the guidance department have in terms of programming? Um, you know, when we think about, you know, what's available and the timing that's available, you know, throughout the year, which obviously, especially, I think, in the middle and the high school, for sure, it can get really packed. Yes. So how much do we individually have um, a say in what it is that we use or what we do? Right. Like, let's say, you know, I don't know, thinking outside the box, you wanted to implement, um, I don't know, bringing like an expert in residence, right, into the school to let them have like, I don't know, a six week whatever to give kids the experience of what it's like to be an accountant or mm -hmm. a construction worker, you know, kind of real life, you know, what type of flexibility do you have in implementing that? So I am fortunate to have quite a bit of flexibility. Um, and I, I think there are two main reasons on why I have that. One, I have, I have uh, a principal and central office administration that do understand the importance of this and that we are trained in doing just this. Um, and um, I think that makes a lot of difference. That's the first layer that's most important on how much autonomy you have in selecting what it is that you do is buy-in from those that, um, that say yes or no. Um, so that's one, but two, and this is probably more important to them than it is to me. Um, but the other thing is everything that is done through this 339 plan, because it is mandated, um, is reported to the state at the end of the year. And so if you have a counselor who is saying, I would love to be able to do this, this, and this, it doesn't cost me any more than this. The schedule I have in mind is this, this, and this, and all the pre-work is done. And it's something that's going to count as an artifact, which I'll talk about after going through this plan real quick. More times than not, that administrator, or that central office person is gonna say, do it, because then you have an artifact and that student has something else in their plan and it's going to make us look good to the state. So a lot of it has to go around time. Um, feasibility on, you know, sometimes something that's more than a few weeks is kind of hard to make sure that you are um, keeping the pace with that. Um, but it happens. We contract with a outside agency that comes in and does um, like a soft skills lesson in health classes for four to six weeks, depending on how, how fast they get through. And all of those things get saved into their portfolio. So I would, I always give really long answers. So I'm sorry if I just said too much, but um, I think if you have a decent plan that doesn't cost a lot of money and it's something that can be easily implemented within the day-to-day -day curriculum, you're going to get a yes because of the focus of this right now. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think one of the key things you said was 
if you can integrate it in the, into the curriculum. So like if you can get uh, some coordination with teachers mm -hmm. uh, and you're not taking away from their class time, but you're enhancing their class, you know, that's, that's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so social studies teachers have become my friends. They're not a high stakes testing area at the middle school level. They love whenever I incorporate the lessons within their classroom. Um, I cannot ask my math department very often and that's okay. I understand it, but yeah, you get, you get pretty savvy on who to ask and when. Um, you can be very warmly welcomed and you can get a hard no, <laughs> depending on, on what it is and what you're asking. Um, and that's just part of knowing, knowing your people, knowing personalities, and that comes with the territory, but with time too. That's one of the biggest learning curves. I think I, I would say comes with the profession, their profession and somebody new in the position. I think as a, like a math teacher myself, I totally understand where you're coming from, Allison. Yeah. Yes. Um, especially at the middle school level, but I know um, what I implemented with some of my students when I was teaching a calculus class because I had much a, like a much smaller group of students. I could work um, more one on one and almost ask, okay, like you're getting ready for like college, like what are you thinking about doing? So some of my students who said, oh, okay, I'm interested in the field of nursing, I would um, kind of think of problems that come under the same aspect, but more enhance what they're interested in. So it kind of got them looking forward to the steps moving forward in their career, which I thought was really cool. I know it's at the later aspect. But no, not at all. I'll talk about this real quick. I said I wanted to mention this, and this was my my aha moment in terms of career counseling. So around 339, um, we were mandated to go through a series of full day and sometimes full week trainings um, with these two consultants from the state. Um, the one gentleman's name is Mike Thompson. Um, he was phenomenal. He was an elementary school counselor, a middle school counselor, I think even a high school counselor at one point in time. He served the role, he lived the life, he knew what it was that we were living and what we were being asked to do. Um, just like some of this historical information can kind of be like, okay, yeah, I get it. Um, you know, it can become, if you're busy and you're not balanced in the developmental domains, it can be like, oh, I gotta get that lesson in. And it, become, it can feel like a hindrance instead of something that's beneficial. But when Mike framed it as, you know, this is the thing. So it's not a thing, it's the thing in terms of your role as a school counselor. He talked about being in a position to help students, all students, regardless of their life. And he was just very like laid back. He was like, doesn't matter you know, if they had nothing for dinner or if they pulled up to your school in a Mercedes Benz, every single person has a spark. Some of those students know what that spark is because it's been nurtured and it's been shared with, with opportunities for them to talk about it. And the students that don't yet know their spark, what it is within them that makes them them and makes them a priority and makes them, a, makes them have a purpose, makes them a contributor you get to be in a position to help them find their spark and it lights them up. It's their spark. And he was very passionate about it. I would never do his speech justice. Um, but I, in that moment of being emotional and hearing him speak and seeing how passionate he was about career exploration, I thought about all those students that hated school that would end up in sometimes my office if they were lucky, but most times it was the principal's office and another detention, another discipline referral, another call home, another lashing at home once they heard it all at school and having that shift happen for them. Like we talk about installation of hope that can happen through career counseling by helping them find that spark and being the person to bring that to their attention. So it was a really aspiring, inspiring training. Um, and it made me appreciate and value that that opportunity that I do have with students. And I think the same goes for you that are not school counselors. If you have an adolescent that's just seeming to be checked out, you know, they have so much stuff going on and the trauma is there and they have no sense of purpose and they have no sense of hope. 
it can be non-threatening and so engaging for them to just, you know, well, what do you, what do you like? What do you see yourself doing? Do you understand? Like if it's something, you know, realistic and in alignment with who they are and you know that, but they don't, you can really bridge that and help them have that awareness. And so career counseling actually is exciting, <laughs> especially whenever it's the first time someone's really thinking about, wow, I do have a purpose and I can use it in this way. So Mike Thompson, he actually just recently passed away. And that's something that I will never forget that he taught me about having students find their spark. So a lot of this here, is just information to hold us accountable. So this next section talks about stakeholders and this just really reinforces all the people that are impacted by this type of programming. So there are students, parents, post-secondary higher education communities, educators, the businesses and community members um, within a district. And then again, a re restating of the roles of a school counselor I just wanted to show you the advisory council is a highly suggested meeting that should happen at least twice a year involving at least one, if not multiple stakeholders from each category. And these meetings have been really helpful in our efforts and understanding what it is that businesses and colleges and employers need to see from students. Um, because functioning in silos is never beneficial. And so we think we know what we're doing and we think we know what it is that, um, you know, next steps, next people need, you know, whether it's schools or businesses and businesses are saying, no, you know, that's not what it is that we need. We need this, this, and this. And so having a chance to collaborate and communicate on what needs to be happening at each level really makes for higher successful outcomes for students. So isn't it funny that, okay, so you have your advisory council yes. uh, and now Cal, Cal U for KCREP has an advisory council, but you're, you're on our advisory council, but you like, so, but you see it from both ends. So I do. you know what I mean? I do. And, and that's like, it can be looked at as another thing, but really it's a helpful thing. It's a, it's a mandate that makes sense and I actually very much appreciate it. And it's nice to just have to have that time to sit together and talk um, because the goals are remembered and they're actually meaningful goals because they're, they're done in collaboration. And so these are the calendars I was talking about. These really are another aha moment like, oh, no wonder why those meetings um, with students in classrooms haven't been happening in January, because look at my January. And so it was a very simplistic activity that really had an impact on all of us. So we had to be intentional with our scheduling. Um, and I can bring this for those that are in person next week too. We have a printed document too, you can kind of flip through. I don't wanna make you have a headache on here. And I'm also being mindful of the time. Um, so these are programs that have to exist if you're in Pennsylvania and you're a school counselor. Um, so some of the information is a little redundant. It just shows up in a different way in a different format based on the section that you're in. Um, but it is comprehensive. It does help give a big picture and it does help to be able to showcase who we are, how we got there, our training, our experience, our education, and then what it is that we're able to do in different as aspects of the school year with the, the students that we have before us. Okay, I think I have to stop sharing this. Oh, I messed up. <laughs> Can you guys still, okay, there you are. I couldn't see you. I'm gonna move on from a few of these. Screen share. Yeah, so while that's popping up, yes. um, everything, 
like this is a good study guide for those of you who are school counselors. I know not all of you are about a little less than half in this class, but I mean, everything I'm seeing here, this is like on, on your praxis too, and the comps. And uh, so, you know, there's, especially praxis too, I would say. So between the praxis too, and your first interview, you know, this is a good, this is a good outline for, for school counseling study guide. Thank you. I was really trying to have those students in mind, all of you in mind, but um, I remember a lot of this showing up for that praxis too. And for me, I took this career course pretty early on in the program. And so Yes, I would recommend maybe printing this and having it on hand if you don't have access to this after this course. I don't know how D2L um, works. For Waynesburg, we have access and then sometimes all of a sudden that access closes um, from previous courses. So I might, if I were you, maybe download and save this just as a refresher before going into some of those exams. Um, especially just with some of those names from early on. I remember sitting, it was a long time ago and I remember sitting and being like, I know this person but it all blends together because they all very much are similar. And so just looking at that quickly beforehand might be helpful. So just one other piece, another mandate that holds us accountable. This career readiness mandate also uh, coincides with um, the comprehensive plan. And so this was just new in very, very recently, 2018, 19 school year, career, career readiness standards uh, were enforced. This um, is a report that I just submitted to the state last week. It's due by June 30th every school year. You have to indicate for each student at these, um, I think they call them grade bands, so grade span, not band. So by the end of fifth grade in the individual portfolio, each student in fifth grade has to have six or more pieces of evidence accumulated from the three to five grade span. Um, and that needs to be able to be accessed at any point in time. And this is their career portfolios or something that can be audited um, during the random audi audits that happen um, within a school district. And so it very much holds counselors um, or those that are in charge of um, monitoring the career portfolio plan. Um, so for me, by the end of eighth grade, students have to have six additional pieces um, from the six to eight. So the ones from elementary still need to be accessible, six more, and then for the end of 11th grade, eight additional. And so those all have to be time stamped in some, some form or fashion and um, be readily called upon if an auditor would like to see that for any student. And so this year I had to honestly report, there were 12 students out of the eighth grade class that I had to say no, they did not meet that standard for this year. I'm again hoping we find grace if that's ever something that's asked for any kind of detail because it was the students that we just could not get into communication with over the pandemic when we were virtually learning. Um, and so I, I, I don't think that that's going to be a factor. I think a lot of counselors were facing that problem but it is something that's reportable every year. So something else to be mindful of. Um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with PA Career Zone. You can access this at any time. I do have it in the slide. Um, I thought it was something interesting for all of you to look at at the time there you're also completing these self-assessments um, because they have been developmentally adjusted, but the same theories and concepts are applied. And so um, we have a paid account. This is where we keep track of our students' portfolios. Um, it's a very reasonable price. We switched from career cruising to PA career zone because it is Pennsylvania based. And so it's in direct alignment with our 339 plans as well as our, um, um, our, our mandatory um, artifact numbers. They understand, whereas career cruising was a national model and it wasn't in alignment with PA standards. So the PA career to work standards or career and work standards um, are in alignment with all the activities. And so that is something that you can access, you can explore it, you can take assessments, just nothing saves, um, but that's available to anybody for free. And then the paid account is where you can save a portfolio. 
This last piece is chapter 13. Um, chapter 13 actually got me the most excited about this, this presentation just because I feel this is where I personally have the most impact in making sure um, that the plans that I have in mind are comprehensive in nature um, and that are they're, they're more sustainable because it is collaborative. Um, so research is just really showing, again, that the more stakeholders that are involved, um, the more impactful and sustainable and effective the, um, co the comprehensive program becomes for each student. Uh, no child left behind, and that involve, evolved to Every Student Succeeds Act. Those are, all, those are all acts that really reinforce this collaborative practice. Um, Collaboration is really something that can't be mandated, but it is best practice. Um, and I find myself to be most successful when collaboration does happen. The case of Frank is maybe what we'll leave on because this does impact everybody, but this goes back to that preschool question. And I think again, emphasizes the importance of collaboration because everybody's lived experience, I think needs to be known and considered before these major shifts occur within our profession. And so I'll promise to be quick, I'm running out of water anyway. It's getting a little loud downstairs as well. <clears throat> but the case of Frank, this is on page 233 of your book. Frank used to be called a shop teacher in a fluent suburban school district. Seeing a renaissance occurring in his region with an emphasis away from manual labor like factories, steel mills, and coal mines, Frank soon saw the same renaissance occurring within his school. Soon, shop teachers became tech ed teachers and dirty shop rooms became, became clean, high tech labs. Frank evolved and when 21st century classrooms for the future and whole child trainings began to occur in his school district, Frank participated with his colleagues. During one of these professional development training sessions regarding technology use in the classroom, Frank looked perplexed. A colleague asked about his expression and Frank responded, I don't quite understand what we're doing. I use technology all the time with students. I don't teach hammer, I teach problem solving. Sometimes we use hammers, sometimes we use computers, sometimes we use other tools. Learning a tool for the sake of learning the tool doesn't make sense. Learning to critically think, problem solve, communicate, and collaborate using a variety of tools makes more sense to me. And to me, reading that and just going through the chapters, that just really emphasizes the, the significance and the, and the importance of becoming um, one who practices collaboration because his perspective has a ton of weight and he is the daily practitioner. And instead of just swiping away the old way because we are now focused on technology, um, his insight and his sharing of his lived experience could help to evolve the practice that, that everyone, that the stakeholders might have in mind, evolve it in a meaningful and more effective way. I think it's important to keep in mind, not everything old is bad. Um, we wanna evolve, we wanna keep up, we wanna be competitive, we wanna meet the changing times, but there is something to be said for teachers like Frank. And I just thought it was a good story. And a case study is always something great, right, right Grafton? <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll be focused on that for quite a while this week. Right. Why not throw in another another uh, case study there for you? <laughs> uh, the other key takeaway, and I will finish up on this. Um, I really like this aspect in, cha in chapter 13. And if you want to know how to es establish partners partnerships, whew, just ask. And I think that's a great way to remember that partnerships and building those um, involve a counselor's attitudes a counselor's skills and their knowledge. Um, so establishing partnerships, just remember to ask and ask yourself those things about your, your own personal and professional standing. Um, and those 
definitely have a huge impact on the level and degree in which collaboration occurs. I just included this for you to have them as notes. Um, this is nicely outlined in chapter 13 as well, but just some components of these, these concepts of attitudes as well as skills and knowledge. The big takeaway for me with knowledge is understanding the culture in which you're finding yourself. And so um, the book talks about not just reading about where you are, but really embracing the diversity and the nuances that do exist as a result of the people that are a part of your community. And so inviting them, having them have a place in the at the table, at the conversation, whatever it may be, really getting to know, understand, and learn who they are, what they value, um, directly shapes the way in which you implement your program. Um, you wanna make sure you have Franks at the table too. These are the ways in which I collaborate daily at my school district. Um, we have um, time appointed to grade level teacher team meetings. Faculty meetings occur once per month. Um, something new within the last two years that has been instrumental in our, in our organization of activities is we have monthly counselor department meetings that never happened before. Um, we allot an afternoon once a month and it's so ideal. If I can reiterate the importance of that, I will time and time again. Um, it's time very, very, very well spent. Um, our advisory council meetings, we do have those happen twice a year and those have been impactful as well. Um, they ha there have been times where community members, parents, even students, which that was eye-opening to me, students have left our, our advisory council meetings and have said, I had no idea this was all going on or I had no idea these are the things that you talk about or do with other students or at this level. Um, and so it really brings common language, common focus and goals to everybody that the program impacts, which that's exactly what we should be doing. So I talked so much, I was the talking head, I never wanna be, but I certainly would love to have any feedback or comments or experiences shared or any questions that I could clarify for you. Um, I hopefully didn't make this too, too much of a school counseling focus, but it was counseling in the schools, career counseling in the schools. So it's kind of hard to not. Oh, great job, Allison. Go ahead and exit your spreadsheets. We'll be okay. able to see everybody's face and, uh, but good job. I mean, Thank I know, you. I know not everybody's going to be a school counselor, but if you're dealing with anybody under the age of 18, you should know these basics because even when I was in clinical mental health, I was always dealing with adolescents and children and part of their life is school. And, you know, it's important. Um, but any questions for Allison? I'm going to share a couple of stories, but any questions for Allison? Next. So this was all. So. These were the chapters in section three that have kind of the information school counseling students need to memorize. Next week, it's more application and it's a lot more fun because uh, there's a lot more stories and uh, uh, a lot more variety. But um, so the first thing this made me think of was empathizing with you because of your student numbers. And, uh, and a lot of times when people see this kind of stuff, they think, oh, this is just more paperwork, more reports, you know, more stuff for me to do. Um, and I just have a couple personal experiences that uh, kind of take this away from uh, kind of uh, book knowledge to my, my personal experience. The first thing with the, with, is with the Ask a Model. And um, we were uh, just getting started uh, with this in, in my first school district. I had done an internship while I was at uh, Shippensburg at a place called Scotland School for Veterans Children. And, uh, and the kids lived at the school. They had usually lost a parent uh, who had served in the military. But they came from Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and Pittsburgh primarily. 
and it was a 99% minority uh, student population. And um, my internship was for two full years, my entire master's degree, and I loved it. And um, so I was intern school counselor. And then I got my first job as a school counselor. And it was in a very rural school district near Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. Dillsburg claimed to fame as dropping a giant pickle on New Year's Eve. You know, that's where my husband grew up. <laughs> did, did you ever see the pickle? Yes, there's, there's, <laughs> there's Picklesburg. There's this like pickle event. I should have like ran for the hills. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal. Big deal at Dillsburg. Yeah, so that that was my school district, and uh, only they were just getting started with school counseling in the elementary schools. So I had three elementary schools. Um, I had the one in town in Dillsburg, and uh, I had um, two very rural ones. And uh, the uh, the thing was. So each, each elementary school had 500 kids and I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I like going around to different schools, uh, but I didn't know how to organize school counseling. So ASK kind of wants you to do what's called a needs assessment. And so the first thing I did was I came up with three different ones, one for the students and that had to be in their own uh, vocabulary, one for teachers and one for uh, parents. Um, and I sent them all out. And it, it basically asked uh, what, what was, what was uh, being done well already, because I don't want to fix what's not broken. Um, and what do you think isn't being done or isn't being done well? What can I add to the school counseling program? And uh, so that was the first part. And I got different answers from teachers, parents, and students. So one example would be um, students don't have any fun with school counselors. <laughs> and uh, parents, are, parents are saying uh, a lot you know, they want some help with some home life problems, maybe grief and loss, maybe divorce or separation or things like that. And of course, teachers, number one thing is study skills and anger management. Um, so I got those answers. And then I also kept track like your calendar, what are you doing in January, you know? And I kept track of okay, how many students am I seeing individually? How many am I seeing in groups? And, and how many am, am I seeing in the classroom? And what topics are they? And after you know the first couple months, I had a good sense of how I was spending time and what the needs were. So it uh, turns out I was seeing a lot of kids individually for uh, anger management, uh, and for some of those other topics, study skills, things like that. These, those were things I could run groups for. And, you know, hey, if you're announcing a group over the school intercom, you don't want to say anger management, come down. No, you want to say like, grizzly bears, come on down, you know, or their school mascot, polar bears. And, uh, or, um, you know, you don't want to say divorce group, you want to say banana splits. So you got to be a little creative there, you know, but that freed up a lot of time rather than seeing eight kids individually, I was seeing one group and, uh, you know, multiple groups at each school. So one group per grade level at each school. Uh, so that freed up a lot of time, and it also helped them talk to each other. They felt like they weren't alone. Other kids were going through the same thing. And, um, and then uh, talking with the teachers, well, I could teach study skills uh, to classrooms, 
you know, time management, mindfulness, study skills, you know, why bother uh, doing all this? And, uh, and then, of course, career lessons. Um, and I could go into the classroom. And, uh, and that really organized things. So that, that was the needs assessment. Here's a side benefit. Helps the students. But it also helped me, not only with time management, but at the end of every month, I wrote a report to the school board. So I only told them all of the things we were doing. Hey, we're running these groups. We're calling it this. Well, I'm doing these classroom lessons, you know, and I always tried to do something special. Uh, so, and if you've ever been to a school board meeting, 90% of the time is people complaining and asking for things or griping about things. Uh, so <laughs> one of my principals came in and they said, this was after a few months, uh, all the school board members saved my report for last because they wanted to end on a positive note. It was like Mr. Rogers, you know? All right. Let's let's end the evening with what's happening in the elementary school counseling. And it'll, it was always something fun, you know, something positive. Things are going well. And uh, so when we were talking about collaborating with teachers, uh, this is where I was thinking, wow, uh, most of the kids in my new elementary school are white and uh, rural. Most of the kids in my internship were inner city and minority, two different worlds that they've experienced. I'd really like uh, them to learn about each other. How am I going to do that? So um, they, were, they had just opened up their first computer lab. So I said, okay, let's do email pen pals. So the teacher wanted to teach them how to use email. The English teacher wanted to teach them how to write a letter. And, uh, you know, so we were beginning uh, to collaborate with teachers and, uh, and they would give them time to do this. And they were pen pals for the first nine weeks and every week they would write each other. Um, and uh, by the end of the nine weeks, uh, I got permission to, uh, they gave uh, free lunches uh, to the kids in Dillsburg and they paid for the buses at Scotland School. So they brought all the kids to Dillsburg. They had lunch together. They played games. And um, anytime we do things like that, you want the newspaper to be there. And they, so they focused with photographs and told about the whole curriculum and uh, the school board got, got a great feel good thing. But what's most important, the kids had a nice multicultural learning experience. And um, so by the end of my time there, when I went back uh, to grad school, um, and they said, oh, we're going to have to hire a new counselor. And they looked at ever, all the positive stuff. Then they hired two counselors. So uh, the numbers were better than uh, more could be done. So if positive things are happening, you're going to get some good reinforcement. And the kids are going to get their needs met uh, to a much better degree. Um, so like there's realistic things that happen from what is first perceived to be a lot of extra work, you know? Uh, all right. Um, yeah, the, the only thing one of my counselors told me was I was an underachiever. Ha. All right. <laughs> Uh, I did have a nice counselor when I when I couldn't handle class anymore. She let me sit with her and talk with her. 
All right. Any any comments? Any personal stories? Any questions? Um, yeah, I'd like to share something. So when I lived in Austin, the school district my children attended elementary school through, um, our school counselor at the elementary level uh, started a program for our school for like a mentorship opportunity for parents and to connect with um, different children in the school. And that was a really interesting program that I participated in for several years and mentored a few different children. And um, just hearing you graft and speak about this and then everything that you said, Allison too, just makes me realize like, I knew that there was a lot of planning and, and the implementation of that program and always really appreciated it. Um, especially as someone who volunteered extensively in the school, but just hearing what you guys have both said tonight too makes me appreciate it even more and the effort that went into that program and how beneficial it was probably for a lot of those students that participated in it. Yeah, good example. And, you know, honestly, the more of this organization, the more time you actually have to counsel. Yeah. I appreciate so much that you just commented in that way and graphed in your stories. I told you last week as I was leaving, I think they're so instrumental in, in school counseling students becoming school counselors and having that identity. I sometimes joke, but in my experience, if this is the case, entering the school counseling profession is similar to the shock of entering motherhood for me and that you think, you know, People tell you stories, you see other people being moms. So like, it can't be that much or that big. <laughs> and it's when you start that day-to-day -day practice, do you realize how much time, energy and planning goes into every single day for every single student? Because all the needs are everywhere. No two students are the same. And all of this implementation and, and, and mandating, it's for every child. And that is our goal. Um, but it's a lot of work. And so I think stories and lived experiences from people in the practice of school counseling is so essential to help prepare you, but you'll never be, you'll never be fully prepared until you're doing it. Yeah. And, you know, um, just to apply this to the clinical mental health counselors. Um, so my wife, she, she is an LPC and, um, but uh, her, she worked at a, a agency called Family Links in Mount Lebanon, and uh, but her job was to go in to schools and work with the school counselor, and uh, so the school counselor would work with the parents and help identify kids who had more serious issues that needed therapy, but it was very hard for them to find time or transportation to get to a therapist. So she had her own office there, but she would coordinate with the school counselor and uh, she would be able to do longer therapy with more serious issues. But then she'd go and coordinate with the school counselor and they talk about what they could do throughout the week. What do teachers need to do to help this child? And, um, there's, and that's a growing field in counseling as well. I was just going to say that that ESSER money that's coming at the coming at the federal level, it, it's it's for mental health in schools um, and mental health in general. But I feel as if those positions in particular are going to be off the charts in the coming year. That's just my take. Yeah. Because the need is there, and it's also just less of a financial responsibility for school districts that are already short on budget, and so it's a win-win because you have these practitioners that are either licensed or about to be, um, or at least, you know, they're trained that can do the work within the schools without the schools um, hiring new staff. So it is, I think you all are in a position to really, if that is an area for you that you think you might have an interest in, it's going to be available to you very soon. And it's, it's more financially viable for a school because uh, like she went to three different school districts. Uh, so they didn't have to hire a full-time person. They contracted with the agency and she could spend her time in three different school districts rather than just one. So that's, that's why it's more affordable for each school district. 
All right. If you have any questions about the exam, uh, email me, but I will create a Dropbox tonight and I'll upload these, uh, this PowerPoint. Uh, it'll be, it takes a long time to do the video. Uh, so that'll probably be tomorrow uh, that I get the video up. And um, sounds good.